Hello, in this video we're going to look at some key points in the development of the model of the atom over time. So a good point to start would probably be around about 400 BC when a Greek philosopher called Democritus, he was the person that coined the phrase atom, which uh, means indivisible or can't be broken down. And he was the first one to really talk about atoms. And then not much really changed until about the early 1700s, where there was a slight change in that atoms were seen to be made of small spheres or tiny solid spheres. So all matter was thought of to be made of these tiny little ball shaped spheres. And you can imagine what that might look like is how we kind of draw atoms when we try to draw them simply nowadays. But we now know there's a bit more detail involved rather than just solid spheres. So if we then move on to the late 1800s, so just under 200 years later, we have the discovery of a very important particle, and that was the discovery of electrons. And this combined with knowledge at the time led to what we call the plum pudding model of the atom. This is a very important key term, and it was basically how the atom was thought to exist, a ball of positive charge with negative electrons embedded in the ball of charge. So it would look something like this, with the black dots being the electrons and the red space being the positive charge. The reason why it's called the plum pudding model, because it looked like a plum pudding at the time, a type of dessert, and there's my version of it there. Not very good, but you understand what I mean. Moving on to the early 1900s, a very, very important experiment was done by two scientists called Rutherford and Marsden. And they did what's called the alpha particle scattering experiment. And we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. But that led to some very important conclusions about the structure of the atom. One of them was that most of the mass of the atom was con concentrated in a center called the nucleus. And that the nucleus had its own charge, which we now know is a positive charge. This led to a new model of the atom and it was called the nuclear model, model, and it replaced what was called the plum pudding model. This is an important example of how new evidence can change theories and ideas. A little while later, a scientist called Niels Bohr, he made some uh, mathematical calculations about electrons, and he suggested that they orbit the nucleus at different distances. And afterwards, experimental observations confirmed this idea. We then had, a little while later, the, the discovery of protons, and then finally, we had a scientist called James Chadwick, who found evidence for the existence of neutrons. Now, this is um, just an outline of some key points about the discovery of the structure of the atom. By no means all of the experiments and work that was done, but some key ideas that you need to know about. And basically, the idea is that new work done by new scientists over time can change ideas about science and about how things look and work. So what we're going to do now is look in a little bit more detail at the alpha particle scattering experiment. This was done by two scientists called Rutherford and Marsden, and they did an important experiment around about 1911. And as we said, it's the alpha particle scattering experiment. And you can see the apparatus or a diagram of the apparatus on the screen there. So what we basically have is some various parts that we should probably label just so we understand what's going on. So there in that kind of red color, we have what's called a source of alpha particles. And we'll look to see what those are in a moment. Very importantly, this uh, pale yellow strip is some very, very thin gold foil. And when we say very, very thin, only a few atoms wide. We also have in green all the way around the apparatus, a fluorescent screen. Now that was important because when alpha particles hit it, that it would light up in the point where they hit. We have a vacuum inside that green area. And in fact, we can also use a detector to detect where the alpha particles are hitting on the other side as well. So if we look at this beam here, which I've just uh, circled, if we look at it in a bit more detail, we can see the alpha particles there. They are being fired at the gold foil and alpha particles look a little bit like this. What we have is two protons, and two neutrons. That's what alpha particles are. And the protons contain or carry a positive charge and neutrons, they have no charge, they are neutral. So overall, an alpha particle will carry a charge of two plus. Charge of two plus. So it'll be a positively charged particle being fired at that gold foil. 
So if we just uh, magnify a little bit the gold foil, so there I've drawn it as a couple of uh, atoms thick, and here's that alpha particle and it's being fired at the gold foil and the results of where it goes were recorded on the fluorescent screen. So what we actually saw was something like this. Particles flying through, you saw one just go back on itself there, a lot of them just went straight through, but some were being deflected off in different directions by different angles or by different amounts. And that was uh, quite a big surprise because that's not what they expected at all. So if we summarize what they recorded, you can see there that the alpha particles landed in a variety of different places, but the vast majority of them landed in that space there. Fewer landed around the edges and fewer still were deflected by very large angles. There was a very small amount of them that actually went directly back in the same direction from which they came. Now, as we said, this was a very big surprise because at the time the accepted model was the plum pudding model of the atom. And that model said that the atoms were solid spheres. And if they were solid spheres, it was expected that the alpha particles would not necessarily, or in fact, not many of them at all, would go straight through to the other side. And they certainly weren't expecting some of them as they did to bounce straight back again. So, just to make sure that their readings were correct, they took over 100,000 readings over the space of many, many months. And when we, or when scientists do experiments again or get repeated readings, we call that the idea of repeatability. So if those repeated readings show very similar or the same results, or if experiment is repeated and there are similar results or the same results, we call that repeatability or the experiment is repeatable. If others do the experiment in the same way and get the same or very similar results, we call that reproducible. So the idea that you can do the experiment again and get again and get the same results and somebody else can do it and get the same results is actually very powerful and actually provides very strong evidence for a particular outcome of an experiment. So those two together gave us stronger evidence or gives stronger evidence for the results of an experiment. That should say stronger, not stronger. So we have these results and what actually happened was that the plum pudding model was replaced with something called the nuclear model. And the reason why that happened was because we had new evidence from new experimental results which changed our ideas of what the model of the atom actually looked like. And it's worth being able to compare the two. So let's just have a look at a few bullet points on that. The plum pudding model said that the mass of the atom was evenly distributed throughout that sphere shape, whereas in the nuclear model, we discovered that the mass is concentrated in the center of the atom. The plum pudding model had a positive charge spread throughout, whereas the nuclear model said that there was a small dense nucleus where most of the mass was. In the plum pudding model, the electrons were embedded it embedded in that positive charge whereas in the nuclear model the electrons orbit the nucleus or they go around that small dense nucleus and the last point is that the atom was a solid mass in the plum pudding model whereas in the nuclear model the atom is mostly empty space so those are the key differences between the plum pudding model which was replaced by the nuclear model and it's a thing you have to be able to do you should be able to compare the two so it's perfect for putting onto a revision card so you could just uh, grab yourself one put those points down for you to revise and remember at some point later on you can highlight those two key things because they are key words from the spec the plum pudding model and the nuclear model and as we said you should be able to compare the two so that's it for this video thank you for watching and i'll see you again soon